now it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce John Stein. He's a senior lecturer at Brown in neuroscience, and um, he is going to share with us a human brain. <laughs> so at first glance, not, not so impressive. Well, the reason is I still have the covering on the brain. So first thing I want, one, a few take home messages. One is the brain is a very important structure, but it's also very delicate. Uh, this is a preserved human brain. If it were a fresh human brain, it would be the consistency of jello, kind of like a soft jello. And if you were to put it on a table, a whole human brain, it would start to collapse under its own weight. So it's very soft, very jello-y. How do you take something like that, throw it inside of a skull, and then walk around all day or play football or tap dance and not have it turn into mush? Well, you have to put it in a bag, fill that bag up with fluid, and float it inside of your skull. So this is the bag. They're called meninges. And the, the top meninges is called dura matter. And if we peel it back, then you see the brain underneath. So don't do this at home, right? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. The nose would be over here. The eyeball would be sort of buried right up in here. And then the spinal cord would come down this way. Okay. Um, if you look at the human brain, one of the first things you'll recognize about it is it's all wrinkly. The wrinkles we're looking at is really um, a good thing. A wrinkled brain is a good thing. Some animals, like rats, um, have very smooth brains. They don't have these wrinkles. And the reason is that what we're looking at here is cortex. And that's something that humans <coughs> seem to have in abundance compared to other creatures. So what cortex is, is a layer of cells it's about five millimeters thick. And if I were to flatten out the cortex and sort of <coughs> uncrinkle it and lay it on a table, it would be about one square meter in the average size person. And it is processing space. It's jam-packed <coughs> with nerve cells. And these nerve cells do all kinds of things. They collect sensory information coming in. They plan motor activity. And I'm going to talk mostly about motor activity today. And control the body. Um, a lot of animals do very, you know, have uh, fantastic movements and control of movements. Um, humans certainly do as well. And we also can mimic and do a whole bunch of movements that you wouldn't normally see in nature. Uh, so we can train it to do a lot of different things. So when you look at this uh, sort of at the gross level, and you could point to certain areas and say, this is a visual area, this is a, an area for movement, this is an area for hearing. Um, the first thing sort of you want to understand is what's the building block of the brain? What are the neurons like? So I'm not going to bring pictures of the neurons. I'm just going to ask you to sort of use your imagination or draw on what you remember from neurons. They're essentially little cells that use electricity and chemicals to send information. They carry messages through the body. And movement is, uh, I don't think there are many neuroscientists that would, that would argue this, this statement. The most important function of the brain in any creature is movement. It's the reason to be. So as animals got larger and larger, and bodies got larger and larger, it became important to coordinate activity. You take sensory information in, you plan a movement, and then you execute that movement, and it has an advantage for you. It gets you away from things that are trying to catch you. It gets you towards things that you're trying to catch on a very basic level. So planning movements is, is uh, sort of the reason to be for the brain. All the other things we do really well, seeing, hearing, taste, smell, touch, are really feeding into the motor system. Okay? So when we were doing that synchronizing events with our hands, we were just doing what, what the brain does naturally. It's taking in sensory information, and then coming up with the right motor command based on that sensory input, which was hearing other beats, other claps around you. Okay. Now, just a real quick thing. We call um, things that people do, movements and such, we call them behaviors. That's what a psychologist would call them. And I'll show you the, the, the most simple behavior. And oftentimes, scientists will go to the simple things first, because in order to understand a complex behavior like a tap dance, it's quite involved. So let's break it down to a more simple movement. And I'm going to go to the most simple movement in a human being, a reflex. And let's just understand it at the level of a neuron. Okay. So let's say you step on a thumbtack. You're not activating the mechanoreceptors, the touch-sensitive neurons in the bottom of your foot. You're not activating those thermoreceptors for hot and cold. You're doing damage to your tissue, and you're activating things called nociceptors. And when nociceptors get activated, that means there's been tissue damage. So you step on the thumbtack, neuron fires an electrical impulse that shoots up your leg into your spinal cord, 
where it spits out a chemical messenger, a neurotransmitter, onto motor neurons that will send electrical impulses back into your leg and contract the right muscles for the right kind of movement. So if you step on something sharp, the right kind of movement is going to be flex that leg. Right? So let's think about this. So it, it appears pretty simple. You've got two types of neurons. You've got nociceptor on the bottom of your foot, electrical impulse to your spinal cord, spits a chemical onto motor neurons. Those motor neurons send an electrical signal down into the leg. They spit a chemical onto your muscle cells, and your muscle cells contract, and your leg flexes. You don't activate your extensor muscles because you'd be jamming your foot down into that tack even harder. <coughs> so it has to be the right kind of movement. So if I stepped on a thumb tack, we understand at a very basic level how that sensory input and that motor output works together. It's one or two synapses, one or two connections between sensory and motor neurons. So it's pretty simple behavior. But it's not so simple. If all I did, if something sort of bit my foot, my right foot, if all I did was lift up and flex my right leg, what would happen to me? Fall over. You'd fall over. So this reflex not only flexes the muscles in your right leg, it extends the muscles in your opposite leg, it goes up your spinal cord and leans your center of gravity over to the left so that you don't fall over. So this is a basic withdrawal reflex. Something hurts your foot, you pull your foot away. But you have to extend the opposite leg and you have to shift the center of gravity over like this. Okay? All of this is happening in your spinal cord. The information is being sent up to your brain to let you know there's pain in your foot. But your brain is not required to do this kind of movement. Okay? Now, let's, let's say we wanted to play a mean trick on this person and coat the floor with thumbtacks. So they step on a thumbtack and they go like this. Now my left foot stepped on a thumbtack. I do not have your balance. My left foot stepped on a thumbtack, so I'm going to go like this. Then that thumbtack causes this. And you basically have the motor circuit for walking. And it's all in your spinal cord, and it's all based on this very basic reflex. So when you do something simple like walking, your brain is just accessing circuitry in your spinal cord and saying, give me an alternating rhythm, left, right, left, right. And your spinal cord takes over. Now, if you see there's something <coughs> coming up and you're just walking like this, you'll have to notice that it's coming and then lift up and go higher. That involves your brain because your spinal cord doesn't know there's an object in front of you. Your eyes see it. Your visual areas tell your motor areas to alter that behavior and avoid that object. So it starts to get more and more complex. <laughs>